Just like that. Let me get my uh, presentation queued up here. Sure. And. Um, OK. So uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, speak at uh, Japan Jamboree number 76. That is uh, amazing. We've been doing this a long time. And this is, it's been uh, because of COVID, we had a couple of con cancellations uh, this year. And so this is actually covering material for a whole year's worth of uh, updates. Um, and this is my March 2021 embedded Linux community update. So um, the nature of this talk, this is just a quick overview of a lot of embedded topics. I do focus pretty heavily on the Linux kernel uh, because that's something I, I kind of follow and I'm a kernel developer or I, I used to do a lot more development, but anyway. Um, this is a springboard for further research. So if you see something interesting, uh, you have a link uh, or something you can search for. It'll give you an idea what the names of some of these new technologies are that you can go search and uh, use Google to find uh, uh, more material if you're interested in it. So some of the material I have here, I have given previously, uh, although less in this talk than other talks. So when I was giving this every quarter, I had quite a bit of overlap, uh, but this has not got so much, but there's still a little bit of overlap uh, with previous slides. And so there are some older slides I may go over uh, fairly quickly. And uh, it's important to note, this is not a comprehensive uh, a survey of all of embedded Linux. There's uh, just tons and tons of stuff going on. This is just uh, some stuff that I have seen or that I, people have pointed out to me uh, that I thought was interesting. Uh, so there's lots more uh, going on than, than what I talk about here. So this is my major outline. Uh, I'm gonna go talk about the Linux kernel, uh, a few key technology areas and uh, subsystems in the Linux kernel, and then talk about uh, conferences and give a little bit of industry news and then point out some resources. So in terms of the Linux kernel, um, here are the kernel versions for the last year. Uh, you, it's been a steady, steady drumbeat, 63 days or 70 days. Those are those are pretty normal times. Uh, we're currently on 5.12-RC2, which is release candidate two. We had the kernel um, merge window was open uh, probably about four weeks ago, and then we've had two weeks of uh, release candidates. Um, there was a little slight delay on this one uh, because there was a winter storm in Oregon and there were power outages and Linus Torvalds uh, actually had some problems. I think I think he uh, he had power out from like uh, well, I'm not sure exactly when, but he didn't he didn't get some of his first integrations in uh, until Tuesday, so that's a little bit slower. He usually starts on a Sunday. Uh, but it hasn't affected anything. Um, well, I'll talk about that. It may have. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the interesting thing here is there's been no discernible impact on the schedule from COVID-19. And actually, that kind of makes sense. Most most of this work is done by email, and it's done from people who are used to working remotely and, and potentially working from home as well. Uh, so uh, COVID-19, has that had any impact on uh, the pace of, of kernel version work? Um, and so now I'm going to go back through some of these uh, versions and just highlight uh, some of the features that came in to these versions that I think are relevant for embedded. Um, and some of these I have slides later on in the talk that I'll talk in more detail about. And others, I'll just make a quick note of them here as we go through the kernel versions. Excuse me. Um, so uh, Linux 5.6, which was released in March of 2020, had the WireGuard VPN feature, uh, which was added to the kernel. And then it also had some uh, work on uh, year 2038 issues, uh, particularly for ALSA, uh, which is the sound system inside the kernel. Uh, there were some new 64-bit structures for some of the operations of that. Uh, there was an interesting thing having to do with SE Linux. So SE Linux, um, there was a mechanism that allowed you to disable SE Linux at load time, so there's a command line option. So that's been deprecated. So uh, they want to, to remove that feature completely, but they decided it would be uh, 
you know, that's that would be a regression in functionality. So the, the plan is to add a painful delay, uh, which increases with each kernel release in order to discourage future use of that particular uh, ability to disable SE Linux. So if you've got SE Linux turned on uh, in your in your um, compiled version of Linux, it's going to be increasingly hard to just disable that at load time, and that's for security reasons. Uh, there was a boot config tool that was uh, that was created to add super long command line arguments to the kernel. That uh, was used mostly for tracing. Um, and then uh, at F2FS, which is the flash friendly file system, uh, gained support for compression. In Linux version 5.7 in May, that was released in May, we had pointer authentication and return address signing for ARM64, which is a, a security, uh, one of these uh, security hardening features. Uh, thermal events uh, uh, can now affect scheduling. The scheduler takes into account the thermal status and actually tries to reduce the load on hot CPUs. Uh, so some interesting power management stuff. The XFAT, so XFAT has kind of a long and tortured history. Uh, XFAT was originally a, a file system that was uh, had had some Microsoft patents applied to it. There was actually an uh, XFAT file system module uh, that was in st the staging tree, and in this version of Linux, that was replaced with a newer uh, file system. So the one that was in staging was uh, a little bit sketchy, uh, and Samsung actually contributed this new version, uh, and it's uh, not in staging. So um, that's actually good. So this is a file system that's good to support. Uh, this was what comes on uh, lots of SD cards and stuff have this. Um, and then also KUnit uh, test results. So KUnit is the uh, one of the testing frameworks inside the kernel. These can now be output on debug FS instead of just to the console. So that is helpful for some of the testing things going on. A couple other things in uh, Linux version 5.7, uh, BPF and preempt RT for a while, those were two systems, Berkeley packet filters, uh, which is a, a system for, well, it's for allowing someone to inject code into the kernel, uh, mainly for doing packet filtering, but for other purposes as well. Uh, there was a bit of a tiff uh, in 2019 between these two projects, and now that's all that's all cured. Uh, BPF and preempt RT, those two patch sets can coexist now. Um, and then a big thing was that LLVM support was integrated into the kernel build system. So you can actually make the kernel using LLVM or Clang uh, and just you know, uh, just have to pass something on the command line well and have the appropriate tool chains installed. And you can also use the LLVM uh, assembler as well. <clears throat> In uh, Linux version 5.8, there was um, inline encryption uh, for file systems was added. So, uh, and that was, uh, for really more of a performance thing than a security thing. You are already able to have encrypted file systems, but this allowed you to do it much faster by using uh, encryption hardware in the storage device. Uh, KGDB uh, can now work with the boot console. So the kernel has an uh, internal debugger called KGDB, and uh, uh, but you had to attach it to a TTY or something like that. And that, this allows you actually now that it can work with the boot console, you can do debugging much earlier in the boot process. Uh, and then there, a new generic kernel event notification system was added. Uh, so, and I'll talk about more about that later. Um, in 5.9, so this is in October, uh, we had a new command line option, debugfs equals, and you can actually debug debugfs. I mean, you can disable debug fs so um sometimes you want to have the debug file system turned on but you don't want uh, end users to be able to access it so uh or you want to turn it off at runtime for some reason there there is potentially um sensitive information that is that can be accessed in debug fs so there's a couple of different options uh when you start your machine uh you can you can turn it completely off so it's not present and none of the debug facilities are there or you can leave it enabled if you but not mountable so you can say no mount as one of the options and uh, that means that the data will be generated by the different uh, programs that that write in normally write into debug fs um, and it won't be visible to any end users on the system but if you have like a crash 
or if you there there are ways to run a parallel server and extract the data with a debugger. So uh, it makes it much harder to get to for uh, someone who's attacking your system. Uh, but anyway, so it's a security mechanism uh, that you can turn that off. Um, there was there was a macro that was removed. There was an, uh, this macro was called uninitialized var. It was used as a hint to the compiler that it shouldn't complain about an uninitialized uh, variable. And uh, to the surprise of absolutely no one, uh, this was some this macro was sometimes used to hide real uninitialized variables that were a problem. So it was determined that this was hiding bugs uh, that uh, people in the kernel wanted to actually see, you know, in terms of warnings. Um, and so that macro has been completely removed. So you have to find another, if you want to, if you actually have a variable that looks to the compiler like it's uninitialized, but there's special reasons for it, uh, you have to find a different mechanism to, uh, to eliminate that warning if you don't want to see the warning. Um, one thing that was caught my attention, which is, which is kind of struck me as odd, was initRD is now deprecated. Um, and at first I got really scared because uh, I think everyone uses an initRD. Well, it turns out that what everyone calls an initRD is actually an init ramfs. So the initRD is the old block-based uh, initial file system that, uh, that Linux kernel can boot from. Uh, these days, everyone uses uh, init ramfs, which is a uh, initial file system in CPIO format, um, but everyone calls that an NRD. So uh, what people are actually using is not being deprecated. It's just this old thing that hardly anyone uses anymore. Um, uh, and then uh, just a new syscall. This is not really related to embedded, but I just thought it, I think it's interesting whenever new syscalls are added to the kernel. Uh, there's a new one called close range, which is a file system. It's a file descriptor close operation, but it operates on a group of file descriptors. So just kind of one of those quirky new things. Um, in Linux 5.10, uh, we had this. There's a thing called static calls. Uh, the set of patches that's been floating around for a really long time, I think for at least three or four years, uh, and it allows for, uh, so there's a lot of places in the kernel where uh, calls are made that are indirect. Um, and but and sometimes, sometimes though, uh, if you want something to go really fast and have low overhead, you want to structure that the indirect call in a way that it can be uh, as performant as possible, and and uh, so instead of jumping through a, a, a function pointer, you want to actually have code that calls directly from the origin, the, the caller origin. Um, so there's this this set of uh, patches that finally got merged that that adds a uh, function static calls. And so you can actually have code that calls one routine for a while. And then if you change your mind about what you want that routine to do, you can stay, call static call update, and it will actually change the caller call sites. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of a way of uh, modifying the kernel on the fly. Uh, you shouldn't use it for all kinds of stuff, but but there there are some places where it, it makes sense. So this is good for uh, tracing functions uh, and potentially some other areas as well. Um, but self modifying code is is always kind of dicey. You have to use it carefully. Um, there's been some work uh, in this kernel. Well, there's been work for actually for a while talking about uh, overhauling printk. Printk is uh, over many years. I think printk is like 28 years old, uh, and but it people are still not very happy with it. Uh, there's a, a there's a lot of issues that printk has uh, having to do with uh, how it locks the console and and things like that. And so uh, in 5.10. There's a new lockless ring buffer implementation. The solution to every new problem in the kernel is a new ring buffer. Uh, sorry, that's just a kernel development joke. Um, so there's printk has a new lockless ring buffer, uh, that, and there's some more changes that are coming in order to make it so that printk is more robust um, and works and works better. Uh, and another thing uh, in 5.10 was the ext4 file system has a new fast commits mode uh, which is uh, which is going to be really handy uh, for uh, and i'll talk about that a little bit later 
Um, it's a it's performance improvement for EXT4, a pretty major one. Um, in Linux 5.11, and this is the most recent released kernel, uh, it, there's a new system call interception mechanism. So there's a way that you can take over system calls and reroute them into user space. Uh, and this is mainly used for emulating Windows system calls, but you could apply different uh, other OS personalities on top of Linux with this. Uh, and it's based on uh, PR control, process control uh, set of system calls for, for managing that. There's a new, uh, another new syscall. Again, this one is not super critical for embedded. Uh, it could be, uh, but you know, ePoll is one of the system calls and ePoll wait is one of the system calls that allows you to uh, check whether events have occurred in the kernel. And the old one had a timeout that could only be expressed in milliseconds. And if I suppose if you're impatient, uh, you can now use ePoll P wait 2, uh, which supports timeouts only in the nanosecond range. So there are some there are some things going on, particularly in real time systems, where you might want to wait for an event to happen, but you don't want to wait that long. Not not as long as a whole whole millisecond. And there are some uh, good examples of. Uh, particularly things that process video frames that didn't want to wait that long. Um, and then uh, another thing came that came in 5.11 was the ability to disable process migration between CPUs. And I will, that's a that's for real time stuff. And I will talk more about that when I talk about real time. And then finally, we've had the 5.12 merge window. I talked about that already. Um, and uh, we can probably expect, so 5.12 is not released yet. It's still in the release candidate phase. Uh, so it's going to be tested probably for another uh, six to seven weeks. And then it should be ready to be released in, in April. Uh, a couple of the things that came out in this, not a whole lot, uh, but their support for OProfile was removed. So OProfile was an old way of uh, uh, using the compiler and uh, to, to instrument the kernel with events. Uh, that support for that has been removed, uh, and this is all superseded by perf events. So perf events and perf tracing and stuff has been uh, around now for, oh gosh, probably five or six years at least. Um, so that old stuff is not needed anymore. Um, there's a new flag called preempt dynamic, or well, it's a config option called preempt, preempt dynamic that allows selecting the preemption mode at boot or runtime. And I'll, I'll talk about that when I get to real time. Uh, there's a little bit more stuff uh, having to do with dynamic thermal power management. Uh, and this is allow, allows the power usage of groups of devices uh, to be capped uh, to meet thermal constraints. And so I'm not sure how that uh, actually works into the scheduler, but it's, uh, but it's pretty interesting uh, system. Uh, and then I have to throw this in just because I work for Sony. <laughs> so uh, there's uh, support for PlayStation DualSense game controllers. So there was actually already support in the kernel for uh, the PlayStation 4 controllers. And now there you have support for the PlayStation 5 controllers. So yay, someone at Sony made that happen. And, and uh, so I feel good whenever I see a upstream contribution from Sony. Um, uh, let's see, there's some more stuff that happened in this though. So uh, in 5.12, uh, uh, we can now use uh, link time optimization features. Uh, so that has to do with um, embedded, particularly size, uh, perf some sometimes performance, but particularly size optimizations on ARM64 and x86 architectures. Now that we can build the kernel with LLVM and Clang, uh, it's nice to be able to use some of uh, those uh, LTO features uh, to do uh, higher order optimizations. Um, and then the KFence memory de debugging tool was added. And then uh, some new perf event features, uh, just a couple of new things. Perf, perf events is, uh, has a ton of features, but it, you can now report on uh, instruction latency for individual instructions. You can see how long it takes for individual instructions to run. Uh, there's a daemon mode that you can uh, use for long running sessions. And there's a whole bunch of other new things as well. Uh, it's where you can look at that uh, commit to see some of the stuff that, that came out. So there was a bit of drama uh, in the 512 merge window, other, other than the fact that it was delayed because of power outages. Uh, so Linus marked the first RC kernel as don't use. 
uh, because it had a bug that could corrupt your file system. So that was really bad. Um, and the bug had to do with uh, a patch that um, ended up causing a bad offset to be used for accessing a swap file. So it turns out that uh, um, most people these days use swap partitions. And so a lot of people did not see this and it didn't get it didn't get caught in testing before in while it was in Linux next. Uh, but when it hit the release candidate, then people started seeing it. So for Onyx side and Intel side and a bunch of their test systems, uh, what would happen is uh, when you started swapping, so when your machine went under memory pressure, uh, it, it would start overriding random places on your disk, which was bad. Uh, so it's pretty bad to mess up people's file systems. Uh, even for a release candidate kernel. So, I mean, it is, it's a release candidate because we're actually testing it. So, you know, usually you have about four weeks or eight weeks in which to test the kernel. So you, you can't, the kernel is by definition not perfect yet. Um, uh, the, the bottom line is uh, if, if Linus goes to the trouble of actually retagging a version of the kernel don't use, uh, you should not use it. <laughs> so whatever you do, don't use the Linux version uh, it's, it's actually tagged in the source tree, 5.12-rc1-don't use. Um, this problem was fixed very quickly. Um, I thought this quote from Jonathan Corbett was pretty fun, funny, though. Uh, he said, occasionally, though, something goes wrong, giving early testers reasons to reconsider their life choices. So I thought, so, you know, if you had, if you lost a hard drive and its contents because you were testing an RC kernel, uh, let that be a lesson to you, I guess. Um, so just a couple of things, some, some interesting maintainer stats, and these are just kind of all over the place. Uh, the first one I have is, is this maintainer one. So what companies are employing maintainers? So you can kind of see who, so there's this issue with um, Linux kernel has a number of maintainers and they, well, you know, in the hundreds or possibly thousands of maintainers, but they, a lot of them work for these companies, uh, just a couple of companies. So Red Hat, Linaro, Intel, Linux Foundation, and Google have a large percent. Almost half of all patches go through uh, kernel maintainers at just five companies. So that is that is a little bit scary, but at the same time, um, it's it's not so bad, right? The, they're pretty well distributed. I mean, the highest one is <clears throat> is Red Hat, and I think Red Hat we can trust that they will continue to employ people to do good things for Linux. And uh, so not not that big of a deal. Uh, in terms of just, just a note on term, terms of active contributors. Uh, so uh, LWN.net did kind of a look, they usually got breakout stats for the kernels and they were looking at the top contributors for 5.11. And it seems to be kind of shifting over time. So a lot of, in the early days, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the contributors, the top contributors in terms of just statistics for line counts and, and number of patches and things, uh, used to be coming from software companies. Uh, and now a lot of it is coming from hardware. So there's kind of be trending towards a shift towards a hardware companies. So you see in the top 13 for 5.11, you see um, some software companies or arguably like Google, Facebook, uh, but you see a lot of, a lot of in, well, in Red Hat, I suppose, software. Um, but you see Intel, AMD, Huawei, uh, NVIDIA, ARM, Samsung, NXP. And I think a lot of that is just natural that you have a lot of these drivers and these companies are getting better and better at uh, getting their stuff upstream. And, uh, well, Intel does both uh, hardware and software contribute. I mean, contributions that are, that are not just related to only their hardware. So they're, they're at the top almost all the time. So uh, just as a side note, so MediaTek, who I have followed for a number of years for various reasons, uh, had had uh, 19,000 lines of changes in 5.11. So uh, that's actually good. So it'd be good to see MediaTek uh, continue to, uh, you know, increase their contributions to the Linux kernel. Um, in terms of top individual contributors, so one of the things uh, that John Corbett did was he looked at individual contributors for various subsystems. Now these. These four substances I have, which are the kernel, memory management, file system, and networking, are just just kind of the tip of the iceberg, right? But this isn't this omits all of the drivers. 
So if you look at the names of the top contributors, this is over the last year, uh, you see a bunch of different people uh, that are kind of the the prime movers uh, in these areas. Uh, but one name kind of stands out. I don't know if you've, oops. Oh, did I? Yeah, there it is. Um, Christoph Helwig, he's like everywhere. The guy, I don't know. He's, I, I was going to dig into this and see, well, man, what is he doing? He's got literally hundreds of patches covering all these different kernel substances. I guess he's, he's a little bit like a kernel janitor. He gets into everyone's office and uh, cleans stuff up. Uh, so that's that's good, uh, but it's amazing that you know one guy has this big of an impact across all these subsystems. Um, anyway, so uh, now I want to shift uh, shift a little bit and talk about something that the Linux Foundation did, <clears throat> and I put it here. I, I could have put this here or at the end of the presentation when I talk about Linux Foundation, kind of what they're currently up to, but I thought it fit better here. So Linux Foundation went out and did uh, what they called an OSS contributor survey. So I did something similar to this uh, uh, about six years ago uh, and was a little bit less formal. These guys went out and they uh, they uh, the survey was actually conducted by two organizations, uh, Open Source Security Foundation, which I'm going to talk about them a little bit later because they're pretty new. Uh, but then the Lab Laboratory for Innovation Science at Harvard, so a major university in the United States. I went and did a very before a formal survey and they produced the report in uh, December. Uh, so just recently, just a couple months ago, uh, they had uh, 1800 responses, some with only partial answers. So the analysis comes from answers from about 1100, uh, almost 1200 respondents. Um, and they found some interesting things. One of the main points, oh, see, uh, one of their main points is they wanted to see how was stuff getting uh, paid for. Uh, and they found, oh. looked at the employment status and 75% uh, of contributors are employed full time and 52% are paid specifically to develop free and open source software. So there's a lot of paid contributors um, the you know, the idea, well, people have known this for a long time. The idea that uh, that Linux is developed mainly by hobbyists, that's, that's long gone. Um, <coughs> But they found that the top contributor motivations, so people who are contributors are paid, but their motivations are not for the money. Uh, okay, and uh, I think if someone who is speaking could mute, that'd be good. Um, and then, uh, so the contributions, the contr contributor motivations, uh, the three main reasons people contribute are they needed the feature fix themselves, uh, just the enjoyment of learning, and the desire for creative or enjoyable work. So, so that is pretty interesting. And so a lot of these non-monetary, uh, non-money related uh, incentives are motivations. That's what pe why people do it. Uh, the other thing they found, and this was really really key, uh, this top one here. Only 2.27% of the time is of, of like a contributor or a maintainer is spent on security issues. And that is a big problem. Um, that was one of the things, one of the key reasons they conducted the survey was to see how much time people were spending on security. And so they're saying that uh, it's probably not adequate to expect um, kind of the regular, the current developers to spend more than that. They We probably need to uh, increase the funding by um, organizations to on security issues. So um, they said 48% are paid by the employer to contribute. So that's an interesting stat, uh, which means that people are getting paid directly to contribute. That's kind of their primary function, uh, but that does beg the question or kind of raises the issue what happens if the employer interest wanes um so some of those contributions uh might drop off um 45 percent of respondents said that they are free to contribute to uh open source software without having to ask permission so th 10 years ago that number was only 35 percent so that's that's a good sign that companies are getting a little bit looser in 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 their contribution policies, they're giving uh, engineers a little bit more uh, freedom. Go and go and uh, perform work in open source without having to uh, go through a, 
a, a difficult process. But there are still some problems. So 17% say their companies have unclear contribution problems policies and 6% don't know what their company policies are if or even if their company has policies. So there's still some companies out there. So that I don't know as an employee I would be a little bit careful if I didn't know what my company policy was about about contributing but uh, apparently it happens. So that's just some interesting data points and I recommend you go look at the study. It's got some uh, interesting data from the survey. So now I'd like to go through uh, different Linux technology areas and uh, just talk about them real quick and the, this list is not super long it's a little bit shorter than previous ones but i do have do have a fair amount of material i can go over so one of the things that i saw at elc um actually this was uh, elc europe i believe <clears throat> was um a talk on also system on chip so this is a kernel subsystem i didn't even know that there was this kernel subsystem but apparently it's been there uh, at least for a little while, but it's a kernel subsystem to provide better also support for SOC and portable audio codecs. Okay, so also support originally kind of uh, was developed when people had sound cards, you know, dedicated cards on desktop systems. Well, now that things, uh, a lot of the audio functions and particularly like the codecs and things are actually embedded uh, on system on chips, you know, like for mobile and, and other things, so the structure of the code is a little bit different to support that type of stuff. Anyway, there, if, if you're doing audio, I, especially on an SOC, I think it'd be really good for you to take a look at this talk. Uh, um, I can't remember the guy's first name. Anyway, Baloney, who's the speaker, gave uh, some, some good material uh, talking about the different protocols, the different uh, hardware interactions between different parts of the chip and stuff. So it's good stuff. Um, in terms of the core kernel, uh, one of the things I just kind of wanted to highlight, there are a couple of those new syscalls that I talked about, but this is actually a new event notification system called a watch queue. Um, and there are a number of different event notification systems in, in, this, in the kernel, basically, you know, an IPC mechanism for communicating stuff between the kernel and user space. This one is new. It's fairly simple. Uh, it just uses a regular Unix pipe. Uh, and the thing about it is it's so simple that people are saying, well, why? Why didn't we think of this earlier? <laughs> why have we been doing stuff? Particularly, uh, this avoids any dependencies on networking code. Uh, this avoids Netlink, which is one of the other IPCs. It's been used for a lot of stuff. I think, I think um, there's still a couple of major uh, systems on Linux that are based on Netlink, and the, the Netlink is kind of a pain. Um, but this may replace other notification systems in the future. For now, it's only used for keyring notifications, uh, but it could potentially switch over to others. But these things where the interface has already been established, they take years and years to change um, because you have user space that's that's reliant on the old systems. Anyway, um, so there's a you can look at the kernel documentation to see some of the information on this. Um, in terms of development, uh, there are new tools. Uh, being used for upstream kernel work, especially a new tool called B4. Uh, and if you haven't heard of this, uh, you're probably not a maintainer because I think almost all of the Linux kernel maintainers are now aware of this, if not already using it. Uh, so the email workflow of Linux kernel, uh, notoriously the Linux kernel still uses email for its workflow, uh, but that often has issues. So there are some email clients and servers that will mangle the data, which is not good. Um, so B4 supports doing patch management outside of email. So you can you can still use email to communicate with other people, but it, <clears throat> it's a little bit easier to use. Uh, there's a there's a service, uh, a, a mail archiving service called lore.kernel.org uh, that stores all of the uh, email patch series, and you can grab those in an inbox, which is a, a mailbox format. It's an archive format for mail messages and use Git to apply it. So it, it provides a lot of benefits and it overcomes some of the problems with using email. Uh, actually, Frank Rowand, who, oh, I, I put an S on the end of his name, sorry. Frank Rowand uh, gave a talk on this at ELC Europe 2020, and you can look at that and go check out the video. Uh, so uh, there's kind of an interesting transition uh, going on. I don't know if it's transition, but there's new tools being made available and they're solving uh, problems. We may see more tools like this in the future. In particular, I well, I have my own ideas about where things should go from here. But anyway, 
Um, so let's move on to file systems. So file systems. So I said F2FS got uh, had recently in the last year got the ability to do compression. Well, it got actually more compression options uh, over the last little while. So in 5.12, it got a high compression mode for LZ4, uh, one of the uh, compression, uh, common compression uh, algorithms or modes used on uh, on file systems and for archives. Anyway, uh, so it got that mode. It got LZ4 high compression mode. It also has a new uh, option, uh, which you can specify on the kernel. Uh, you can specify on the kernel command line to control whether the kernel or user space controls compression. So it actually op allowed the user space to control um, the compression of the files on a file by file basis. So in in conjunction with that, there's a new IOCTL uh, that allows the user space to, to indicate which files should be compressed. And, and so that gives people a lot more um, uh, a lot more control over the file system and what's going on uh, with compression in it. So IOU ring, which is the new asynchronous read and write interface to the kernel, um, that continues to mature. I think this is IOU ring seems to be like a really good idea and it seems to be taking over. Uh, it's got quite a lot better performance than some of the old asynchronous IO uh, support. Um, and it just seems to be a cleaner interface. Any, anyway, just in the last couple of releases, it supports the T system call. Um, it can now do asynchronous buffered reads without using kernel threads. And it also has been integrated with memory control groups, so it does better accounting and can be regulated better uh, with respect to that. I think we'll continue to see this. I think this is going to become the primary asynchronous I.O. mechanism for the kernel over time. So. Um, and then I told you I was going to come back and talk about ext4 fast commits. This one is pretty exciting. Um, it's not every day you see something that can give a performance boost of 20 to 200 percent, depending on the workload. Um, so that's that's pretty amazing. Um, <clears throat> so this introduces uh, a new a second journal. So there's already a, a journal in ext4 for handling uh, data recovery in case of a of a you know power out or a crash, um, but there's now a second journal which holds the changes that have occurred since a standard commit was updated. So you have kind of two levels of journaling, and the fast commit journal has file level data. The old standard journal had block level data, and because it was block level, it ad ended up having um, a lot of data. Uh, well, when you did a particular file operations, they would end up in lots of blocks being updated. Uh, but this fast journal uh, omits that block data, and it, it also omits, importantly, data that can be recreated from other sources. So if it's possible to kind of figure out from, from other data uh, what needs to be changed in a recovery operation, uh, that, doesn't, that data doesn't need to be saved. So this this dr dramatically reduces the amount of data that needs to be saved. So the fast commit journal is uh, just ends up using a lot less uh, write operations. So the fat the the tricky part is that fast commits cannot be used for all kind for all of the operations that the file system performs. So for instance, uh, if you have a file system that uh, when you modify extended attributes, that's kind of a non-standard operation and. Uh, what the system does is it falls back to doing a standard commit in those cases. Uh, so, uh, so it, in any event, you're always you always have the possibility of recovering uh, during recovery. If if you ha do have a file system crash or the power goes out, uh, first the standard commits are replayed by the journaling layer, uh, and then the fast commits are replayed by the file system layer. So there's a big performance improvement with it, with this. Um, again, depending on the workload, uh, but that's it's really interesting. Uh, I I always find it fascinating when um, you find some performance improvement on this scale with code that's been around for like literally decades. Uh, well, maybe XD4, at least a decade. Um, so that's pretty good. Uh, so in terms of graphics, one of the things I saw was a good talk on using Flutter in embedded systems. And I am actually not going to talk about it too much uh, because I saw that it is, this is actually on the uh, schedule for later in this jamboree. Uh, they're going to uh, do this presentation uh, that was given by um, 
Matsubayashi-san from, from Sony. Uh, but Flutter supports, the basic idea is that Flutter uh, plus Wayland may be a, a good solution for embedded products uh, for graphics. So there are other solutions out there currently, but there's um, they all have kind of interesting issues for embedded. Uh, one of them is Qt is, is okay, but it's got some license issues. Um, and X11 based ones also uh, have some performance issues. Uh, anyway, Wayland is now supported on many SOCs uh, and it's kind of their successor to X11. And it's lighter weight than X11. So Flutter supports cross-platform development, uh, but it generates native code. Um, it is written in the Dart language, so I'm not sure what that means. I think it means that you have to write your interface code in Dart, but um, it has fewer library dependencies. You only need OpenGL or EGL. It's also got a nice easy license, BSD3. So I will I will stop talking about that because I think you're going to see it later today. Um, <clears throat> in terms of networking, one of the talks I saw or kind of reviewed was uh, this one on precision time protocol. So there's uh, I don't this is not a new protocol, uh, but there are a couple of new uh, things in it uh, that just came out recently. Um, so uh, PTP is called is used for synchronizing clocks between machines. So what happens is you put uh, timestamps on your networking packets and you send them, and then the there's a protocol that goes back and forth, and the the computers try to eliminate uh, the overhead caused by the network transmission and calculate very accurately what the what the real time is from each other. Uh, but this requires very, very accurate timestamps, and it requires that the timestamps be applied as closely to packet transmission time as possible. So you don't want to have a big latency. You don't have a bunch of software layers between when you put the timestamp on and when the, the packet actually starts transmitting physically on the wire. So uh, there's you can use ethtool-t uh, to manipulate this or view the status of your uh, timestamping. Um, and there's, uh, you can specify to use either a hardware clock or a software. Well, it's always going to be a, um, there's going to be a software or a hardware, piece of hardware somewhere under there for timing, but, but you can generate, there are special purpose clocks you might use uh, independent of the system uh, high precision clocks. Anyway, uh, Anyway, you can use uh, two, two user space commands uh, to manage all this. Uh, PTP4L, which I, I'm guessing stands for PTP for Linux, uh, which is ma for managing the hardware precision clocks, high precision clocks. And then uh, PHC to Sys uh, is also used to kind of convert all this stuff into turning it back into the time on your system. Anyway, if you're interested in networking and particularly in kind of real time networking, uh, this is something you may want to take a look at. Um, and so this that was a little bit related to real time. The two big things that happened in real time recently were in the 5.11 uh, kernel. We have this ability to disable process migration between CPUs. So this is really, really good for keeping uh, a real time process pinned on a particular CPU. So um, normally, uh, a pro Linux, the Linux kernel will, when it schedules a um, something to run, it will pick uh, the next available processor. You know, if something has not been running, it'll as a processor becomes available, it'll it'll just have that process run on the new on the new processor. Um, that's part of the whole SMP thing is you can use any of the processors for any of the processes, um, but. Uh, that is pretty bad for latency uh, because there's a lot of issues with um, the caches and, and the timings involved uh, when you start up a, a process on another process, when you allow process migration. So it turns out to be a hard process. Who knew? <laughs> well, I think everybody knew that was. Um, anyway, but you can now disable it in 5.11. I know for a long time people have been talking about, uh, there have been kind of other systems to kind of prevent this that have been kind of ad hoc that have bolted, been bolted on, but now it's actually integrated into the kernel. So this is very nice. Uh, the other thing is uh, in having to do with real time is this preempt dynamic uh, that allows selecting the preemption mode at boot time or at runtime. So now you can actually, uh, instead of just compiling the kernel uh, as either 
uh, config preempt equals none or config preempt equals voluntary. You can compile it as config pre preempt dynamic, and then you can choose at boot time. And actually, you can choose at runtime. So you can switch between uh, preemption modes uh, at runtime. And I would have not thought that this was even possible because uh, I thought different code was generated, but apparently, um, apparently this is something you can do now. So that could be really useful for real-time people. Uh, so for security, I think I already talked about WireGuard VPN uh, a little bit. So WireGuard VPN is a new VPN system uh, that's intended to replace IPsec and OpenVPN. Uh, it was actually added a while ago, almost a year ago, to the Linux kernel. Um, and it's neat, and it has some great features. I'm, I'm not going to go through this because I've talked about this before. But it's, it uses Linux IP commands to set up the tunnel, and it has, has some nice features. Um, and then uh, inline encryption for file systems. So this is a new system that allows uh, the kernel to offload encryption and decryption to the storage device. So um, instead of uh, the kernel using like cryptographic hardware on the CPU or <clears throat> available on the CPU bus or doing the cryptography itself in the CPU, you can actually <clears throat> when you when you use either of those solutions, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> when you use either of those solutions, uh, that in incurs a whole bunch of overhead um, because you have the either the main CPU or crypto hardware. You have a bunch of dust uh, buses. The data is copied multiple times. So there's a lot of uh, storage hardware these days that actually has encryption uh, built into that hardware, and this is a way to allow the file systems in Linux to use that um, encryption stuff capability of the, of the storage hardware. So the kernel manages the setup uh, of you know, what crypt crypto keys are going to be used, stuff like that. But then the storage device handles the actual cryptography itself. Uh, so uh, and another feature is that the kernel can validate that the encryption is working as, as expected. And this, this was added uh, support for ext4 and a few other file systems uh, already, already support this. I don't know, well, anyway, so I think you have to have special hardware, obviously, that, so that has this hardware encryption decryption support. Um, uh, this one I think I'm going to pass over really quickly. This is the new boot config system that allows you to post, put extra boot configuration um, into the device tree, or, or the, it was going to go into device tree, but it was... Uh, turned out to be kind of not a good match. And so it is now loaded with uh, an NITRD instead, or an init ramifest, if you're going to call it the right thing. Um, let's see. Let's, uh, let's go on to testing. OK, so in testing, just a couple of things. One, the SysBot fuzzer, which is one of the main uh, testing tools, automated testing tool that runs on Linux kernel, continues to find an alarming number of bugs. So the number of unfixed bugs climbs every release. So um, that's bad. It means that we're probably only scratching the surface. This bot um, only has is only covering about 10% of the kernel so far, and it's already found over 2,400 bugs. I think it's found closer to 3,000 total bugs. Some of the bugs, when they bisected them and figured out when they got into the kernel, uh, were there have been there for years. And the problem, we, we need to be fixing more fugs than we find. This is, uh, the next page has a chart here showing the status of open bugs. We are not fixing bugs as fast as we are finding them, which uh, I guess in testing you want to find bugs, but uh, at the same time you you do want to fix them. So uh, this, is a, this is a bit of a problem, this, and uh, hopefully we'll get more resources assigned to, to fixing these these known bugs, some of which could have security ramifications. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about, and mainly just because it's a project I'm working on, um, is this thing called Board Farm REST API. So TimeSys and Sony have been working uh, on a new API that we're trying to standardize. Uh, it's related to hardware testing. Uh, so a lot of Linux testing is done um, on on uh, virtual machines. In fact, all of that SysBot testing uh, in that last chart, that's all done on virtual machines only and only on x86 virtual machines. So it's, um, but 
when you're testing hardware, uh, sometimes the parameters are different. A lot of times what you need to do is you have to you have to control not just the device under test, but you have to control hardware that it's communicating with, like a, a USB endpoint, or if you're uh, generating video, you need to capture the video. And there's no standards for, for how that is done. Uh, and so uh, TimeSys and Sony have been working on uh, prototypes and an implementation for this to do a web-based API to manage the other endpoints. And I can't get into all the details. It's kind of way too complicated for this. Uh, but uh, we did demonstrate a simple GPIO test at ELC Europe uh, using this, and we're continuing to work on, on it. Uh, if you're interested, uh, please go look at this. And maybe for one of these uh, jamborees, I can, uh, I'll can i give a presentation on this because this is kind of the new thing that I've been working on. Um, in terms of tool chains, it's now possible to build the full embedded Linux system with Clang. Uh, you can build Linux kernel. You, you, you've been able to build Linux kernel with Clang for a while now, at least six, eight, eight months, uh, a little bit longer if you're willing to apply some patches. A little, it's har much harder to build a full distribution, a full embedded Linux distribution. But there's now a layer called MetaClang, which is available in, uh, that works with the Octo project. Uh, so you can actually build a distribution in the Octo project using Clang. So there are still some individual patches that will have problems. Uh, they have not succeeded at building GC, glibc with Clang. Uh, so you can't use that, or if you do use it, you have to use one that was built not with Clang in your distro. But but you can use if you use the uh, MUSL or Muscle C library. Uh, you can have a project that is 100% built with Clang. And Debian has actually got had a project going for a while, and they've got so far they've got about 96% of their packages can be built, uh, which is pretty good. That's thousands of packages. That's over 20,000 packages um, that uh, can be built with Clang. So uh, that means that LLVM and Clang are really coming along in terms of their compatibility and stuff. So that's good. Um, just on the topic of tools, independent of tool chains, uh, which is the compiler and stuff, the tools, uh, I saw a great talk on static analysis for embedded. Uh, this was given by uh, John Simone Moeller at ELC Europe 2020. Uh, I did not realize how many different tools there are. So people are probably uh, realize that there are tools like uh, Sparse and Cosinel that can be used with Linux kernel to do static analysis, but there's a ton of other ones available. Uh, so there are lots of great tools available for static analysis, and this means testing the code without executing it. Uh, there's a new option, relatively new, in GCC called Dash F Analyzer, which does uh, static analysis of your code, and Clang has something similar called Scan Build. You can use those on the kernel. There's actually a Yocto layer that's been put together uh, by a developer that has 87 different tools that you can apply to uh, your code and different projects. And then there's another one called Meta Code Checker, Code Checker, which is another Yocto layer. And Code Checker is a really cool tool. It also does a static analysis and can analyze a full build and generate reports and stuff. Anyway, uh, if you're interested in this, uh, go see this talk by uh, John Simone. And uh, last thing uh, on the kernel, I believe this is the last one, or on technology reports. Um, the long-term support has been upgraded to six years. Uh, that was a relatively recent. I can't remember when this happened. I think it was probably about August or September. Anyway, uh, I cannot believe, frankly, that Greg Crow Hartman and Sasha uh, Levine, who are the, the maintainers for the long-term releases, that they can support it this long. Uh, they must have some really awesome uh, processes in place to be able to manage this because they're managing a lot of kernels. I, the the problem is not so much uh, managing a single kernel for six years, but they've got the when you extend the lifetime support out to six years, you end up maintaining six years worth of long term support kernels. So that's that's a lot of kernels. Uh, one a year, that's at least six kernels. So um, pretty impressive. Uh, so that's something and that's actually really beneficial for the industry. That uh, that means that. Uh, uh, you can be much safer putting uh, a kernel into your product and knowing you'll get updates from the community for it. So that's really good. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears completely and talk about uh, conferences. So <clears throat> conferences, well, what happened in 2020? Well, due to COVID, everything went virtual. Okay, so we did 
We did continue having conferences though. So we had a bed and lunch conference, was in June, it was virtual along with OSS Summit. We did have plumbers uh, that was virtual in August. ELC Europe was virtual in October. So there's an open source summit Japan. It actually changed dates, uh, but it went virtual and, and was available. So there's still all this presentations and online material that's available. So if you go to the eLinux wiki, you can find the material for these events. And uh, so that's good. So we, we do have uh, stuff that has happened and people at We've been able to have talks and stuff. It's not the same as being there in person, but we have had a lot of exchange of technical information. So coming up in 2021, well, so far we, we've got a mixed bag. So Embedded Linux Conference North America, uh, it's not gonna go virtual. It was actually completely canceled. It was planned for August in Vancouver. Uh, the Open Source Summit North America was also canceled. Uh, so just plain dropped off. And there was a lot of reasons for that. Part of it had to do with, uh, it had originally been planned to be in person, uh, but then the venue scheduling, uh, they thought they could do the venue scheduling and it, well, it just turned out that it didn't work out. Uh, and it was so close because of the venue scheduling, it ended up being close to Embedded Linux Conference Europe. And, uh, but because it was, once once they decided not to not to have it in person, they thought, well, we'll just put all of our effort into one conference. So Embedded Linux Conference, I should say Embedded Linux Conference Europe 2021 is scheduled for September 26th through 28th in Dublin, Ireland. So the venue is booked and we have contracts in place, but it would probably be wise to wait until summer to make your travel arrangements if you plan on going to this. Um, and the the big question of course is what is going on with COVID-19 so when will conferences no longer be canceled um so ELC Europe in late September is actually the first Linux Foundation in-person event on the schedule it's the first one that we're that we're planning on having but honestly it's still tentative so the situation is changing as people get vaccinated so the Linux event staff Linux Foundation event staff is watching Ireland to see what their numbers look like uh, and they're making contingency plans. Um, there are lots of positive signs, but we I really don't think we'll know for sure if this is going to happen uh, for another couple of months. Um, and even after we start meeting in person, uh, we're going to continue to have kind of a hybrid style of events because they're even if some people feel comfortable traveling, there'll be other people who don't or their companies have not shifted their policies yet or their countries are in a different situation. So uh, we learned a lot in the last year about having virtual events and there are some real positives. It allows a lot more people to come to or to participate in an event if they can't travel. Uh, and so we're gonna keep doing uh, virtual access to events uh, even even for the in-person events even after they start so some of the things that that will uh, be happening with these hybrid events is that we'll continue supporting virtual access we want to make improvements for virtual attendees so some of the qa that we've been doing uh, previously has just been by chat and that's been kind of awkward and not very good we'd like to be able to do live q a during sessions for for virtual attendees so they can mix in with the in-person attendees and also allow people if they want to speak virtually, if they can't attend, uh, even if it's an in-person event, we'll try to figure out how to allow speakers uh, to be virtual and do the same thing, have live Q&A and everything. So uh, we'll see what happens with that. Once we start doing in-person events, because COVID will still be around, or we think it will, so there will be on-site changes uh, for in-person health consciousness. So. Uh, that should say reduced attendance, have that E get in there. Reduced attendance, social distancing, masks and extra cleaning. So the Linux Foundation event staff has been making all kinds of uh, plans and for how to handle things with COVID restrictions. Uh, there'll probably be some changes to format of some event activities. For example, you know, nightly socials will not be the same uh, if there are COVID restrictions in place. So, uh, but, but I think it's, you know, we'll be able to have them and we'll be able to make people, we will make sure that people feel comfortable and safe when we have these. So safety is the top priority. Um, last thing, just uh, LF continues to push for inclusion. So we have programs to encourage outreach uh, and we have diversity training for speakers and we have a lot of 
a lot of aspects of the of the conferences. We try to get uh, a very diverse uh, range of attendees and speakers and participants. Uh, we were really hoping we could do uh, uh, the event in September because Tux turns 30 this year. This is the 30th anniversary of Linux, the September 1991 when Linux was first released, and now it's September 2021. So. We we're hoping we could have some big parties. I don't know about the parties part, but uh, we'll see if we can get together. Uh, we'll probably, even if we can't get together, uh, we'll we'll make some plans to do some fun stuff. Um, now, industry news. I just want to cover cover a couple of things real quick, uh, and I'll do mergers and acquisitions, trade associations, and a couple of interesting cases of embedded Linux. Um, so, mergers and acquisitions. I just have this one. NVIDIA uh, has, you know, agreed to buy ARM from SoftBank. So this is a pretty big deal. I mean, ARM is like, they have more processors in the world than anyone, right? So um, SoftBank bought ARM for about $32 billion in 2016. Um, they tried some stuff. Uh, hard to say whether it worked well or not. But NVIDIA came along and is buying it for a mix of stock and cash valued at potentially $40 billion. This is all under intense scrutiny uh people you know antitrust groups and governments agencies are looking at this to make sure it can go through but right now it's on track uh and that would represent an interesting shift so you know there was a little bit of an uproar in the uk when arm was sold to an outside the uk organization um and so uh, i'm sure that there are people at arm who are concerned about you know what nvidia's plans are for the future, but you know, ARM ARM has a good solid business, and uh, and uh, Nvidia uh, has well. I mean, they use they're a big user of ARM, and so I'm sure that they will try to integrate it uh, more deeply into some other things. But but in a large uh, in large part, they'll probably keep their hands off the main business. It's not like they're taking it private and not supporting licensees and stuff like that. Um, so that's just kind of big, big news in there. In terms of trade associations, I just want to talk about the Linux Foundation. I had some other ones on here I've talked about before, but I, don't, I didn't have that much information on them this time around. Um, and uh, and I'm heavily associated with the Linux Foundation, so I just know more what's going on. So interestingly, the financials are looking very good despite COVID. So a lot of a lot of companies kind of suffered uh, through the COVID. And a lot of and a lot of uh, nonprofits suffered during during COVID. So, I mean, I'll be honest: the event revenue took a little bit of a hit, but uh, the training revenue has really ramped up. Uh, Linux Foundation is very healthy. Uh, we have more than one new member per day signing up. Uh, in terms of training and mentorship, uh, as of January, they passed uh, two million trainings and exams that had been delivered. Uh, they've got all kinds of different new training. One of the ones I thought was interesting was they've got COBOL training. So if you uh, if you are want to learn to go maintain COBOL, you can do that now with Linux Foundation training. Um, uh, and COBOL is still out there and needs to be maintained. Um, they have a new suite of tools uh, for managing projects, and they have put a lot of time and energy into these tools. And these were announced. Uh, They've been announced previously, but uh, Linux Foundation just had a member meeting uh, yesterday, and they talked about uh, these uh, these really powerful tools for looking at for managing open source projects, and they're uh, they're rolling them out to all of the projects inside the organization, uh, and, but they'll be open source, so I believe that people even outside the organization will be able to use them. So it's, it's for thing doing things like measuring contribution rates and uh, kind of the health of the code base. There's things for uh, looking at the security of the projects, what vulnerabilities are there. Uh, there are tools for tracking and managing mentorship, uh, doing crowdfunding. So uh, uh, some of the projects get their funding from um, from membership dues, but other, other projects also have crowdfunding, so where they get funding from the public. You'll also be able to manage your own private events for your individual project uh, and uh, manage your training. And there's a control center for looking at all the all these stats. 
So some of the tools are actually online now. You can go take a look at them if you kind of want to see uh, what they look like, the types of things they measure. Uh, you can go to lfx.dev for that. Just by way of illustration, some of the stats that they're able to pull out are pretty amazing. So this is this is a slide that they're able to generate because they have all these new tools that show them show them all kinds of information. So if you look across all of the projects uh, that Linux Foundation has, um, there are 11.7 million lines of code added weekly. Uh, and there are 208,000 contributing developers, 12, 000, over 12,000 contributing companies and 16,000 repositories. So, I mean, just, you know, the numbers are really staggering. So Linux Foundation is uh, without a doubt the largest organization in the world that manages open source software or that uh, helps helps projects manage their open source software. And uh, so that is, it's a lot of work. And the Linux Foundation was finding that it really needed to uh, have tools to allow it to scale. Uh, with the number, of, so I'll, in my next slide, I think it says that we're getting 31 new projects a day, or not a day, uh, per quarter, 31 new projects in the first quarter of 2021. And you just can't manage this manually. You have to have automation, you have to have tools uh, to be able to support this this level of, of, of management and uh, so just one one example of this is uh, down in the lower right hand side, the CLA contribution. So some of the uh, a CLA uh, contributor license agreement uh, is is something that some projects have. Not every project has it, but some projects have them. And it's a, a little bit of um, legalese that contributors have to sign or their company has to sign in order for them to contribute. And just for a for a when you when you you know you can have a Linux Foundation lawyer looking at um, you know tens or hundreds of these, but when you get to the scale that the Linux Foundation is, where you're dealing with thousands and tens of thousands of these, it just gets impossible. Uh, and so there's now tools to be tracking these things and uh, at scale, and that's really the important thing. So. In terms of LF projects, there's lots of projects being announced and in the pipeline. Oh, 34. I, th I thought it was 31. 34 new projects in first quarter of 21 alone. Um, some big initiatives. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to go through about five or six here that I think are pretty interesting. So uh, they had the Public Health Initiative, uh, which was just started in 2020, uh, almost in response to COVID. And it has to do with open source contact tracing. Uh, so the co the organization was put to very to, together very quickly. It was a very big success. They started quickly, and it is already providing code that is used by public health authorities around the world. Uh, so there are a number of U.S. states that use this code, and a number of countries, uh, country level public health authorities that are using code that's open source that's managed by uh, Linux Foundation project. So and uh, that that is really pretty cool. Uh, a couple other uh, initiatives that just caught my eye out of out of all these ones that the Linux Foundation does, the Mobile Native Foundation. So if your organization is doing mobile app development and uh, deployment uh, at scale, so uh, this is something you probably should look at. If you're, if you're writing Android and iOS apps, uh, there's a lot of issues having to do with testing and a continuous integration and, uh, and then deployment uh, at large scale. And the companies said, well, why are we doing this all on our own? You know, we know other companies have are facing the same issues we are. So there's now a foundation that helps uh, helps uh, companies work through the issues and hopefully they'll have some standards. They say they want to do for uh, Android and iOS app deployment what Kubernetes has done for cloud um, and, uh, and for uh, container deployment. So, um, so well, that's an interesting project. Another one is OpenChain project. OpenChain just had some really great news. Uh, they had the OpenChain spec became an ISO standard, an international standard now uh, that defines the standards for open source compliance. And SPDX was also recently approved as an international standard. Uh, so that's really, really good news for those of us who uh, work with uh, open source in the supply chain. Um, and then two more. One I want to comment on is OpenSSF. 
So the Open Source Security Foundation, this is a comprehensive project to enhance OSS security, not just the Linux kernel, but all kinds of different projects. And so they, uh, they are just ramping up right now, uh, but they want to cover vulnerability disclosures, security tooling, best practices and training. They already have a couple of edit, uh, edX courses online available for free if people want to learn some security practices. Um, and the, the main thing is they actually want to secure pr critical projects. So they want to actually go out and do work uh, in terms of patches and commits and, and features, I guess, for um, for projects like the Linux kernel. So the Linux Foundation had a project in this area before called the Core Infrastructure Initiative. And that project continues. Some of the people, some of the individuals who are working on that project are, are still working and are funded. Uh, but that work is now being absorbed into this larger organization with kind of a bigger mission and quite frankly, uh, better funding. So I think this is really positive for the industry. Uh, the other one that I want to highlight, just because I thought it was really interesting, is something called SigStore. Uh, and this supports the signing of software and storing records permanently in a secure public log. So what this, what problem this solves is people being able to trust the code and, and in particular, the distributions and the binary packages that they're getting. So this is going to be a, a suite of software and a free service. And people have compared it to Let's Encrypt, which is a free service that offers uh, you know, generation of uh, keys and uh, certificates. Uh, so this is going to be free to use for individuals and organizations. You can look up some of the details there. Uh, what they did was a group of, well, one individual in particular, but a group of companies went out and did a study of current practices. And they found that very few projects were signing releases. And there were very there were even fewer consumers of these projects that were actually checking the signatures because it's a, it's a big pain. And there are a lot of uh, security issues and there are a lot of kind of management hassles related with that. And they want to cure that. They want to make it... Uh, the thing they really want to do is make it very, very easy to use, uh, and they have some ideas how to eliminate key management and some of the uh, some of the hassles that go along with that. And they want to make it trustable, so and um, so that people can trust uh, that the code and the binaries that they're getting that from from places are are can be trusted. It's harder to inject malware into the into the distribution system for for code um, it uses open id for authentication and something called a public transparency log uh, and it should be fully available this year so you can actually go there's a good article kind of giving an overview of, of what this is all about so that's another project that kind of caught my eye okay last thing i want to do here right at the end here is just talk about uh so i i want to talk about uh linux in a couple of very interesting uh, embedded situations. And one is the Starlink satellite constellation and the other is the Mars helicopter. Um, just because uh, it's cool, right? It's cool to see Linux going into new areas and, and doing new things. And outer space is, is kind of a cool geek thing to look at. So the SpaceX Starlink satellite constellation, uh, this is a picture of uh, the uh, a group of uh, 60 satellites that are about to be launched. Uh, they kind of look like this, and they're circling the globe, providing uh, internet service to underserved areas uh, like the middle of the ocean or rural rural locations that don't have good connectivity. So it turns out uh, that these are using Linux. So SpaceX has been using Linux in their rockets, their Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy rockets. They use them in their Dragon space capsules, and they use them in their Starlink satellite. Well, I didn't realize that each Starlink satellite has over 60 processors running Linux. So if you look at the number of current satellites in orbit, uh, that's uh, 1,141 as of March 4th, you know, a couple of days ago, uh, it means there are now over 70,000 instances of Linux in orbit right now. And uh, SpaceX uh, currently has permission to, to put 12,000 nodes in orbit and they've actually requested permission to put 42,000 nodes in orbit. This would be well over 2 million instances of Linux. So uh, we're going to be surrounded by Linux. Well, you probably don't realize you're surrounded by Linux already. I mean, there's so much Linux around it around you that you just don't know. Uh, Linux is in your car, your TV set, your phone. It's it's everywhere. Uh, but now it's going to be overhead as well. So um, so I thought that was pretty cool. 
Uh, just a couple of interesting tidbits about this. So uh, the Starlink software uses multi-computer voting for fault tolerance. So they actually are using, you know, they have the same code running on multiple processors. And so if one of them gets hit by, uh, you know, gamma ray or something, or you know, some other piece of radiation and it causes it to fault or something, they have other processors to handle the fault tolerance. So th they're doing this instead of the much more costly radiation hardened processors that have been used in satellites forever. So they're able to build these for a lot cheaper uh, than, than you'd think. Um, and that's, and they can run off the shelf uh, because of the way they're doing fault tolerance, they can run off the shelf uh, operating systems on them. So uh, uses a mostly vanilla Linux kernel. Uh, they are using the preempt RT patch and they have uh, custom drivers for their hardware, but they said there's it's not a lot different than what you get from kernel.org. Um, they are, it's a real-time system. They're, they use careful programming to achieve deterministic performance. So uh, they do kind of the normal things. They don't allocate memory at runtime. They don't have unbounded loops. They're careful with their priority version. Anyway, this is, uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. So we might have Sometime in the future, I don't know how long, maybe five or 10 years, we'll have 2 million Linux nodes running in outer space, uh, managing a lot, well, probably not our ISP traffic, but a lot of people's ISP uh, internet traffic. And then here's some sources for that material. The other one, which is super exciting, is the Mars helicopter. So uh, I don't know if you realize, but a, hel a helicopter, uh, the Mars Ingenuity helicopter was, is on, the Perseverance rover, there's a rover that was sent by NASA, it landed on Mars in February. <clears throat> and uh, on the bottom of it is this helicopter. They haven't, they haven't released it or started it yet. Uh, the intent is to perform tests and demonstrations. The big thing that's going on here, which is really kind of mind blowing, is the use of COTS in space. COTS stands for commercial off the shelf uh, hardware and software. So. So if you look at the processor that's on the rover, it's running VxWorks. It's a rad hardened, radiation hardened processor. And the processor on the rover is like $250,000. Okay, it's a very specialized, uh, it's very thick lines. And it, because it's radiation hardened, they're just super, and you know, you know, you don't just buy these off the shelf anyway. But the helicopter that's, that's under the rover and is gonna be released soon, uh, is using a Qualcomm Snapdragon 801, the same processor that's been used in mobile phones. So they picked one when they started, the project is a couple of years old, right? So it takes a long time to develop the hardware for, for a space mission. So they chose a processor in 2014 or 2015, same processor that's used in mobile phones of that era. And they actually bought some of the components just off the shelf. One of the LiDAR, one of the radar units, uh, it, it was purchased off of SparkFun which is a hobbyist site for, for this type of stuff. So the development cost for the whole program is still high because you have staff and, and engineering $80 million, right? So when you, when you think about it in those terms, the cost of the hardware is not a huge deal, but it is over time, right? So it, it's really exciting to see uh, Linux and other open source software be used on, you know, hardware that's available to to anybody at a low cost so some of the hardware is just this is just for interest sake uh, uses uh, 1.2 meter counter rotating blades they have to be large they're spinning very very fast 10 times faster than earth drones and this is because uh, mars has a very thin atmosphere uh, which is only one percent as dense as on earth it's got a 13 megapixel forward-facing camera uh, and a 0.5 megapixel uh, downward facing camera for train mapping and navigation. It's got a bunch of sensors on it, a laser altimeter and and uh, other hardware that you know goes along with this. Um, the interesting thing from our standpoint is that it's got lots of open source and in particular it's got the Linux operating system. So I've been running this closing game uh, at Embedded Linux Conference where I've been uh, asking for years and years, is Linux on Mars? And uh, or is Linux on another planet? And this is the first time Linux has made it and is actually on another planet. Uh, so it also uses uh, OSS flight software, flight software that's been made open source called F-Prime. And you actually go out and get this off of GitHub. 
and use it for yourself. The guidance loops are running at about 500 hertz, uh, doing feature tracking at about 30 hertz. Uh, it does it. It's not a high level of autonomy. It can't like you know find things and go look at them all by itself. It does a pre-programmed flight. Uh, it can do things like you know it, it does the train navigation and and stuff like that because. Uh, interesting tidbit: Mars has no um, Mars has no magnetic field, so you can't use a compass. And uh, inertial sensing systems, right, have drift, and so so they had to go with uh, with vision oriented uh, navigation. So it, just some interesting stuff. Anyway, I think this is super cool. Uh, we don't know when it's going to run its mission. Uh, it, they have a thirty day window for flights. Uh, and then that's all they get. Then the rover, the rover, this is not the main attraction for the rover. The, the rover has to go and leave and do its other science work. Uh, so they're only going to, uh, I think at most they have five flights that they can do in that 30 day window because they have to download the commands, run the flight, get the data back. So it takes a couple of days uh, for every flight that they perform. Um, I'm not sure when the flights will be yet. Uh, they haven't actually scheduled them yet. I think my my best guess is that they'll be sometime in April. Um, uh, they have three flights already planned, uh, the fourth and fifth flights. Uh, we'll see, you know, if everything goes well, if the thing doesn't tip over and then, you know, if it works, they, they'd be great if they could get five flights out of it. They won't be doing, with the helicopter itself, they're not going to do a whole lot of Mars science, right? So this is, they'll be taking pictures, but they don't have like science equipment on the helicopter. The science equipment is all on the rover. Uh, but this is just a demo that it can be done at all, you know, especially a demo that it can be done with off the shelf hardware and with Linux operating system. So, you know, everybody cross your fingers. I don't know what the correct Japanese term for that is, but everybody, uh, hope that this goes well. It'd be, if it, if it, if it doesn't go well, that'll be really disappointing. But the main idea here is just to test all this hardware and software capabilities in an extreme environment. Um, this is the first time it's ever been done. Who knows whether it'll work, but it, you know, they have, I mean, they ran simulations and they ran tests and pressurized things. And so uh, we'll see. JPL with Jet Propulsion Labs and NASA, they have a very good track record with this type of stuff. But that will be super interesting to see what happens. So we're all hoping for success of Linux on another planet. Um, <clears throat> here's some of the resources uh, if you want to look up more information on that. And then here's some of the resources I used for my talk. Uh, I get a lot of stuff off of LWM.net. You can see that from a lot of the links that I have. Some of the content uh, is delayed by two weeks. So if there's something that I just barely saw in the last week or two, <clears throat> it might be a paid for. But yeah, you, all you have to do is wait. Uh, a week or two and it'll be available to the public um, if you're a non-subscriber. So that gives you a reason to please go subscribe. If you're not subscribed to LWN.net, uh, please go do that. Also, eLinux.org has uh, a lot of presentations uh, on you know topics that have recent entrance and then Pharonix and Google. So with that, uh, that's all I have. So uh, does anybody have uh, any questions? I will pause for a moment to. Yeah, go ahead. Speak. Please speak up if you have any question. <clears throat> no questions. That's OK, too. I'm afraid say just, you know, just a bit in the shy so that. <laughs> If you yeah. look in chat, there are a couple of questions in the oh, are there? comments. Okay. Let me see. Okay. And when I'm in presentation mode, how do I got to figure out? Let's see. What is this one? Okay. Chat. Oh, okay. Oh, there's a bunch of stuff. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, someone says that's something really interesting going on at MediaTek. They are mainlining drivers for for really old chips uh, from companies they bought out to. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see. Yeah. 
Uh, here, Matsu-san says, B4 is not a good name for Googling. Yes, I agree with that. <laughs> Do you know why, especially for Japan? That is, a B4 know, is there. a paper, paper size regulation name. So that oh, yeah, 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 yeah. B4, a bunch right. of, you know, paper size will be yeah, paper size. And yeah, also the Subaru, you know, market, uh, automotive uh, car name. It's also yeah. B4, so it's so much confusing. Yeah, maybe maybe hard to well just add B4 Linux or, uh, but it's nice to type. I love yeah. I love things that are easy to type. Right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Matsumoto San says ASOC is more for simple hardware like DMA engine connected to a DAC uh, than ARM SSEs have. I think. Um, hopefully, well, there's someone. Yeah, anyway, okay. I yeah, you would know more than me. <laughs> Let's see. Um Oh, version 5.4 is used in Ubuntu 20.04 LTS. It's 5 years supporting. Oh, that's really good. I didn't know that. Uh I'm not running Ubuntu uh 20 yet. Uh so if they're using an LTS kernel, uh, for a long time Ubuntu was not using LTS kernels. So that's actually really good. Um, uh, so that means you'll get distribution support and kernel support for at least five years. Uh, that's really nice. Uh, thank you for that bit of information. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, here Matsu-san says, I want to download Falcon 9 Linux. <laughs> well, <laughs> isn't it released under GPL? Well, that's actually a really interesting point. So if if you buy a Falcon 9 rocket, I'm sure that you can get the source code. <laughs> so, but right now the Falcon 9 rockets are being distributed to outer space. So, uh, I don't know. I don't think they have uh, <laughs> LTS. Oh, someone someone mentioned LTS patching in space. Oh yeah, I don't know. Uh, VxWorks has a really famous story about being able to patch one of the rovers. Uh, it was very, very, I can't remember which Mars rover it was, but VxWorks has been running on Mars rovers for many, many years. And But they had one example where they had a real-time, they had a bug in their real-time, priority inversion bug, and it was causing the, the rover to crash. And they did a patch. They actually did a, a software update to the rover. That is that is dang impressive. Um, I don't know. I don't know. If, how easy it is on Starlink. I actually, I think, I think they did. I think I read when I was reading up on the Starlink thing that they, um, that they can upgrade the software on the, it makes sense. They said that the, the guys who, uh, they did an interview, which is where I saw some of this stuff with the guys at, at SpaceX. And they said they treat the Starlink like, um, like a server. Uh, I mean, they have so many nodes, it's kind of like a, a server room. So in some aspects, they have control aspects. The control of the satellite is very, very, uh, they're very, very cautious with what they do with that. But with the stuff that runs the communication network, uh, they, you know, they do software updates on it. And, you know, and they, they, they even said they do A-B testing. They will try some software out on one group of satellites, uh, but keep a control on another group and then compare the results and see if the fix that they were intending worked. So, so it, that's actually pretty interesting. Um, we may be able to play drones without any regulations on Mars. <laughs> well, yes, that's true. Uh, I don't think they're going to give control to any of us, though. So, I, and and the the first flights that they're going to do with the helicopter uh, will be very, very um, well. They're they're going to be very careful because they don't want to. So they're going to do the first one. I think is just a straight up, straight down. Uh, and then the next one is like a maybe go up and over and back and, and down. So they're doing very careful, being very, very careful because they actually don't know. I mean, they've done physics tests here on Earth, but, you know, until you actually do it on, in on Mars and in the atmosphere and with, you know, those conditions, you don't know what's going to happen. And so they're, you know, they don't want to have the first test go go bad. Oh, yes. And someone says, how about Martians? <laughs> Well, yes. If if a Martian were to come grab that, I think that would be a big win for science. Uh, as long as we got the the, uh, the rover is going to be filming the the uh, helicopter. So if they can catch a, a Martian on helicopter on a video, that would be great. Um, 
Let's see. Oh yeah, first person video. Someone someone talked about first person video. Oh, I'm sure uh, they'll have some great footage uh, that would be really neat to fly with goggles around Mars. Um, and so I think that's it for the questions. Uh, in, in, any other questions before before I sign off? Is it okay for everybody? So this is just a, you know information for you, but uh, uh, in making a presentation in Jap in uh, environment of Japanese, somebody send uh, some of the chat in eight 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 eight. That sounds uh -huh. for patch 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 patch. That is uh, some of the uh, some some mimicking sound of the clapping. Ah, okay. Yes. So if you find any any of the eight 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 in in chat, you will be uh, you will be applause. Okay. So anyway, that, that, oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much and uh, have a good evening today. And if you can join, uh, please join again one hour and t uh, 20 minutes later. OK, yeah, I uh, I have some other stuff to, that I got to run off to, but I hope sure. to be able to join back. OK, so, thank you very much. Thank you very much and have a good evening. OK, bye. Thank you. Thank you. So. Uh, the you know next uh, afternoon se noon session will be will be starting one a uh, one p.m. so that uh, please join again. Ichiji ni nattara session saikai shimasu. Sore made o hiru de aru to ga ano otori kudasai. Mata please come back again. Mata motte kite kudasai. さん一旦ビデオのレコーディング止めますかあそうですね。